The next paper is kinetics of the oxidative coupling of methane over promoted rare earth oxides. Jay Devoy and RF Hicks from the University of California, Los Angeles. And I guess uh, Bob Hicks is going to be. Uh, the work I'm going to talk to you about today is the work that I did while I spent a year and a half at WR Grace. And at WR Grace, we were interested in methane activation, uh, and we wanted to be able to convert the methane into a liquid fuel. So Jeff was the person that worked with me on this, did all the experimental work, and this was at Grace in Columbia, Maryland under Louis Haganis. The work we're going to talk about is somewhat old. It, it took uh, Grace a little while to let me talk about this, but back in 1984, uh, they became interested in methane activation, and it turns out that oxidative coupling is the only reaction for which oligomerization of methane is thermodynamically favorable. So we have, this then became the reaction worth studying if we wanted to make liquid fuel out of methane. Um, of course, methanol is another possibility, but uh, in the, when we looked in the literature, the work by Henson and Barron's suggested that this could be done in reasonable yields. And with a straightforward process in which we fed methane and oxygen together, we also noticed that in their early paper in 1983 that the support strongly affects selectivity and uh, I've always been interested in, in support effects so we began to look at this. Next slide. So this is the first thing we did was we took what uh, Henson and Barron thought was the active catalyst and put it on several different oxide supports. and. Uh, what I want to draw your attention to are the last three catalysts there, uh, 7, 1, and 0% lead on lanthanum oxide. And in the next uh, column, you'll see selectivity, which is the amount of uh, methane converted into C2, that's ethylene, ethane, and higher hydrocarbons, versus the amount of methane converted into COX, that's CO and CO2, versus the total amount of methane converted. So that's our selectivity to coupled versus uh, oxidized products. And what you see is in those last three catalysts there, as we remove the lead, the selectivity goes up and stabilizes even with a fairly good selectivity when there's no lead there. So that gave us the idea that um, the lead wasn't necessarily the important ingredient that actually a basic material such as lanthanum oxide could be a good catalyst in its own right. So, excellent. So this was uh, work that was really aimed at developing a catalyst in a process, and uh, since we were very interested in getting our results as fast as we could, we took the Edisonian approach and we pretty much screened the left side of the periodic table where there are the basic metal oxides, and indeed this bore out our expectations that alkali, alkali earth and rare earth oxides exhibit the highest yields. And, uh, catalyst uh, transition metal oxides generally promoted complete oxidation. Uh, lanthanum oxide is among the best, and although we were uh, um, late in reporting this to you today, there's the uh, patent that describes the, these composition of matter to grace as being the uh, catalyst of choice for oxidative coupling. And this works also so is reported in INEC research. So I'm not going to talk too much about that. I just wanted to show you some trends and correlate oxidation state, ionic radii, and basicity with uh, the selectivity for oxidative coupling of methane. So since we were screening a lot of materials, I only can present general trends to you today and not uh, very much in the way of detailed mechanistic work. But it's interesting to look at these two tables here. In the first table, we're correlating the prevalence of multiple oxidation states with C2 selectivity. And these were all 
obtained a standard set of reaction conditions which are shown at the uh, bottom of the, the uh, slide there. Okay, what we see is as we go from lanthanum oxide to praseodymium oxide to cerium oxide, the number of oxidation states and the prevalence of plus four versus plus three oxidation state increases. And if you look in the column under selectivity, you see that selectivity to coupled products goes down. Again, if we put a transition metal oxide in there with three different oxidation states that are accessible under reaction conditions, we see that mainly COX is produced. Um, so this says that uh, we want to use catalysts which can't cycle readily between different oxidation states. On the bottom table there, we are correlating something else, which is ionic radii, polling radii, and the isoelectric point, which is obtained when you put the oxide in, in water. Okay, so that's an indicator of basicity. And you see that as we descend the row in the periodic table from scandium oxide to lanthanum oxide, the ionic radii and the basicity increases, and then if you look at selectivity, you see that that correlates with an increase in C2 selectivity. So I think in a, in a very qualitative way, this bears out that idea of uh, basicity is important for promoting this reaction, the coupling reaction. So at the time, this was we thought was an important finding that methane coupling is, is favored by solid bases. So we, we think that the coupling reaction is, is an example of solid base catalysis and that uh, multiple oxidation states promote total oxidation. And this was also the conclusion reached by several other groups uh, at the time, Lunsford in America and uh, uh, oh, there's a guy in Japan, I can't remember his name at the moment. I'll come up with it. Okay, so now I'm going to change the discussion a little bit and talk about some kinetics that we observed on one type of catalyst. This is a one weight percent strontium on lanthanum oxide. All these materials are low surface area materials. A lot of them we pull out of a bottle, so uh, there's a minimal amount of, of surface characterization work and uh, I guess enough to to uh, get the patent, but not enough to understand the mechanism. Anyway, here is a a uh, slide which shows the ethylene and ethane production rate based on the amount of methane converted versus the residence time. And what we see here is that we are operating under low conversions of methane and oxygen, and we generate straight lines. These straight lines. Here are indicative, the slope is indicative of the rate of reaction at these three temperatures. So you take these coupled products, the C2s together, and you get what is a primary product of the uh, coupling reaction. Then in this next overhead, we are showing the CO and CO2 production rate and versus residence time, and again we obtain straight lines, different temperatures. So if you take the CO plus CO2 together, that's a primary product of um, oxidative coupling, or a primary product of the reaction at low conversions. Now from these slopes we can we can plot up the data in our Arrhenius plot and get apparent activation energies. And what I want to point out to you here is that the apparent activation energy for the coupled product versus the COX are different. And based on our understanding of how the uh, methane is broken apart and then subsequently coupled to C2 products, we can conclude from this large difference in activation energy that the carbon oxides and the coupled products are attained by uh, separate and independent pathways on the catalyst surface. There's one other interesting thing that we found out was that when you just look at CO production by itself, the, you don't obtain straight lines of uh, the rate with residence time. And also the other interesting, so the curves are fairly flat 
And the other interesting thing is that the amount of CO produced decreases with increasing temperature. So this suggests that the CO is produced somewhere in the middle of the reaction sequence or is rapidly consumed in a subsequent reaction or that it's involved in a equilibrium process with some of the other products of the reaction. So another interesting uh, aspect of this is we found that the CO production rate when plotted against the hydrogen production rate, produces a straight line for all the data that we collected. So the CO and the hydrogen are very closely coupled in products in the reaction network. So this, combined with the previous slide, indicated to us that, that the CO is uh, related to the amount of hydrogen produced through the water gas shift equilibrium. Finally, one more figure which plots selectivity versus methane conversion. And here what we did was to vary the amount of uh, methane versus oxygen and uh, to go to higher conversions. And what we, uh, all these conditions, we're converting essentially 100% of the oxygen fed. And we found under this condition we obtained our best selectivity to couple products. And we see here that when we get to methane conversions above 20%, the products of the, the coupled products of the reaction begin to be oxidized to form CO and CO2. That's shown here. And so there really turns out to be a barrier to uh, the yield that you can obtain at about 20% methane conversion. Now this is for a situation where you feed methane and oxygen in together into a fixed bed. So this is the best that we could do with the various catalysts we studied uh, for the coupling reaction in a simple co-feed uh, fixed bed catalytic reactor. So to summarize what we've learned from our kinetic study <coughs> is we, we were able to postulate a reaction network for the formation of the principal products of this reaction. And this is in agreement with uh, other work by Osuka in Japan, that's the person's name I forgot, and also Lonsford and Kimball and Co Coates with uh, the, the promoted magnesium oxide catalyst. Anyway, at low conversions, you form methane. Uh, well, methane is consumed to produce ethane. It's also consumed to produce CO and CO2. And then the ethane can be subsequently oxidized to form ethylene. Uh, then the CO and CO2 is coupled together through the water gas shift equilibrium so that substantial amounts of hydrogen are also produced in this reaction. And finally, at high conversions, you can also produce ethylene by just dehydrogenation at the high temperatures of the reaction and also they'll be converted into carbon oxide. So this summarizes the kinetic results. Ethane and CORX are formed in separate parallel pathways catalyzed by the oxide surface. Hydrogen is produced at a water gas shift equilibrium. Uh, products also catalyze at high methane conversion and uh, we believe at this point that reaction engineering studies are needed to determine what the optimum yield over these cows would be. Thank you. Question? Yeah. Did you try promoting any of these with alkali metals? And did you ever use any radical initiators such as C4s or chlorinated methanes in your reaction? We looked at uh, just about every combination of, of uh, three, two to three components on the left side of the periodic table. And our conclusion is that lanthanum oxide by itself is the, the best, at least exhibits the highest yields for this reaction. The, what was found by Michael Wax after me at WR Grace is that uh, what a lot of these promoters do 
is is what's going on is you're putting the lanthanum oxide into a bath of water and that causes the lanthanum oxide to, to uh, rehydrate to form LaOH3 which then has a higher surface area and then when you take it out and put it in the reactor you stabilize a slightly higher surface area which is the cause for the increased uh, yield. So the promoters, Michael was never able to prove that my strontium or, or some of the, the other promoters are good catalyst or actually promote the reaction. It's more what happens to lanthanum oxide. And no, we didn't look at uh, adding other initiators or, or chloride agents or your second question. Yeah. Hey, do uh, you uh, look at the effect of the gas phase? Ethylene, for example, can be oxidized in the gas phase at 500 centigrade without any And you consider the effect of gas phase intermediates? Uh, we think that that's important at the higher conversions. And uh, that may explain why uh, you can form C2H4 from C2H6, even when oxygen isn't present. So, but we didn't uh, pursue that, the high conversion work very carefully. Yep. As in the case of this, a magnum oxide were exploited by a Zucker, where the fortunate situation of having the initialization energy of your desire for the action being higher than that of the acid of one. And I wanted to ask you, uh, what stopped you from exploring higher temperatures, which in principle could perhaps give you a higher selectivity? So, uh, what kind of problem did you encounter on going to higher temperatures? Well, over the range that we we looked at from about uh, uh, say 650 to 850 degrees C, you see about a five or ten percent improvement in selectivity as you go to higher temperature. But um, we, no matter what the conditions were, we always had this barrier about 20 percent methane conversion. So we, uh, with the time constraints and where we were, we didn't really. Uh, get very far with optimizing the, the yield. And, and I think really the way to do it is to have a different reactor geometry in which you you feed the oxygen down the reactor so as to always minimize the total amount of oxygen present. Thank you, Bob. Thank you. The next presentation is entitled Oxygen Insertion Mechanisms and Selective and Complete Oxygen.